Guys, uh, Paul and I are members of CTBP, as you can see, right? The center for theoretical. Biological physics. Okay? Now, let me tell you a story about the center and about the research we do, as we learned during this week. I'll talk a little bit more. Although we both come from a physics training, in all our groups, we have students that came from physics, chemistry, quantitative biology, computer science, bioengineering. So, if one time you guys in, are interested on this part, proteins, you can go up to genome structure, chromosome, and stuff like that when you think about graduate school. Feel free to apply to any place like Rice or Northeastern. And if you decide to do that, don't send a blind application. Send the application for whatever department you feel more comfortable. You can work on the center coming from any of these departments. Just shoot an email to me or him so we know to bring your application to the process that we know will go in there. See, you guys are doing great. You guys may be thinking about graduate school. I can tell you, I have been very successful with my graduate students. See, Paul was my graduate student. So they are doing well. So think about it. Okay, that's something when you think about it, it's always easier, and you may do that with some other people here in the school. Is good, particular if you come to some school people don't know or stuff like that. It's, it's, it's not that committees are against you, they have a hard time evaluating you. But we have you here on the course. We really enjoy all of you. I think you're a fantastic group. I want to congratulate you guys for it. I have been, we have been giving this course a long time for your level of activity and energy and participation. So think about it. Graduate school is coming soon. You are always welcome. You can find our emails around. And Paul. I also want to ask if any of you have questions about graduate school, the programs, find the right programs for you, applying, you can always reach out to me as well. If I don't reply, there was probably a technical problem, so just send me a couple more emails. <laughs> I will not ignore your email. That's just uh, me getting caught up in other technical Okay. Okay, so with that said, I think we finish basically the invitation, propaganda, whatever you want to call part of the way. We're always looking for, for smart people. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can tell you the why we all search for smart people. I tell all my friends, people always say, oh, I applied for a grant. It's so difficult to get money. I will tell you, get smart people is harder than getting money. That's my experience of running a research group for a long time. So it's actually, Sometimes, sometimes I think, particularly in Brazil, people get so obsessed with money, they forget that basically that uh, the human quality is the best resource you can have for any effort you do and coming together. And uh, in terms of graduate school, success requires a synergistic relationship between the professor and the student. It has to be something where everybody profits out of it and go there. Okay, so now let's start with real science. So you start with real science, I want to remind you what Paul told you about what we call, we call a structural based models or basically, he told you you can run simulations with full atomic force field, we just run with structural based model. The structural based model is the proteins have this ability where organization, how organized you get is correlate to energy. Right? And this gives you what you call funnel landscapes and this is something we have learned about. Now, why these areas became, uh, why energy landscape uh, became very successful? So I said, basically, you learn everything from Paul now, so now you have these tools on your hands. I'm going to try today, as far as I can go, tell you a few things you can do with it. How do you compare with experiments? How do you bring this together? How do I bring all the knowledge, all the capacity that I created, that's in my hands, to solve real problems. Because like we learned, you don't want to run simulations just for the sake of running simulations. Right, like you're running a video game, you want to say what, which scientific questions can I answer 
So that's one more tool that is on your hands. These days, actually, I may tell a little bit about, a little bit about machine learning later on the class if I have five minutes. But again, it's a tool to learn stuff. You have to figure out which scientific problem you're going to solve with that. So one thing I told you before, and I want to bring this up for you, is the following. What I told you when I did those very simple models, I told you the proteins were two-state-like. So that's simple proteins are actually two-state-like. OK, so what's the consequence of, of something being two-state-like? You have two forms, the denature or the unfolded part, and the native part that's folded. And if I'm telling you this process is really just two states, you're either on a disorder state, order state, you're really first order like, kinetically is like you're moving between two states. Nice thing is, if this is the process, you can write very simple equations for that. Tells you that the variation of state is the rate when you're in nature to fold, that's k fold, or when you're in nature to unfold, k unfold. And basically, you just change the signs if you're moving back and forth. So this is a two-state problem. Nice thing about it is that you can solve this equation. If you assume, for example, in this case, whatever you have at, at the time zero, whatever distribution you have, what you're going to do is, in the long run, you're going to have an equilibrium distribution that comes from these rates. And the solution is going to be time dependent, like that. And you start to observe its dependence in terms of these exponents. That's the k-fold, k-unfold. That's the way the system decay and equilibrates as a whole. Now, if the system looks like that, you observe, you can measure these quantities by fitting those plots. And you can try to fold, you can try to fold log of those concentrations in terms of k folding and k unfolding. For what you observe is very simple proteins are really exponential process. If I plot on this log plot, you see that uh, folding is aligned because it's just an exponential. And I can get. But some proteins, like cytochrome C, have more complex process. So the nice thing about doing a model is when I assume that a model is two state, now I can start to look at experimental systems and say, do they show me a two state behavior or they deviate from the two state behavior? If they, don't, if they deviate, problem, you don't have a process, problem, this protein has intermediate states or get partially fold and then something else to arrive. But things like that, if you look at the experiment, it's already giving you a clue that something else is happening. In the case of cytochrome C, they have a big heme group, this big aromatic group in the middle, right, that you need for a, and that thing sort of a, you have to operate on binding to it before you do, and you can figure out what that intermediate process is. But the nice thing is, if I develop a model, what I assume that's a two-state behavior, there are consequences to that. And I can see if the data is consistent with, with this consequence I told you about. So that's one of the great things. And then there are more interesting cases, like, for example, the case of ribonuclease A, where you observe that this protein, when it unfolds, gets trapped on intermediate state. And it has a known exponential behavior. But the folding state is exponential. So this one is the protein fold, right? So you're really looking at the data you can start to make understanding of what's going on, what's happening on this process, what's happening on your lives, and what's going on. So this is just for you guys to have a feeling when you do the simulations, you can use a kinetic view to coordinate with the sampling view that you have. So when you look at your simulation yesterday on CI2 with a fantastic fast folding protein, I'll tell you a little bit more about it, you actually saw that's two state. You can see with your eyes doing your simulation that you, you either unfold or you either pack and go together. Actually, you can see they simulate these proteins. You can actually see these intermediate states appear on your computer, even if you do a structural-based model. 
because like the silicon see these are structural traps that give these intermediates. So it's great because now you can run a simulation like you ran yesterday and you have a look on those long movies. You always start by looking at, it's not quantitative, but it gives you a first hint. Then you can quantify all those variables by, but you start to observe when you run CI2, that you only see two states. There are some situations where you see intermediates showing up and now you can see if that's real consistent with the data and things coming together, okay? So if the protein is two states, then this is for completeness. Like I sent an email from the lecture before, I'll send an email with these slides afterwards, so don't, try, don't, don't worry about taking notes, you're going to get them. The nice thing is, there's always, like I told you, a relationship between the kinetic factors and the non-kinetic factors. As expected, if you're exactly at the folding temperature, that means that K-fold and can fold are equal, right? So clearly, this term here, that's your equilibrium constant, they are the same, it's going to be equals to one. That's when you're equilibrium. So you have a complete relationship between the kinetic parameters and the equilibrium parameters. If you're going at a system, okay, and as expected, if these numbers are not the same, they are going to create a difference of free energy between them. That comes from the relationship of these probabilities. The same way that you have a barrier, and the barrier comes from where? The barrier comes from the fact when you're kinetically moving, if you have to form a contact or any contact, they have to come together. As they come together, what happens to your entropy? Gets smaller, so you pay entropic price. So you pay entropic price to go up, but then when you make the contact, you get the energy, you come down. But the kinetic process gives you a barrier. So this barrier depends a lot. If I have a model like we did yesterday that's just pairwise, Every time you make a contact, you, you get a pay. If I had to make all the contacts before I got my entropy down, if I have a potential where my energy is not like pairwise like you did yesterday, my energy is that multiple contacts have to form, then you have a big barrier because it tells you you have a big entropic price before you can get the payback to go down. So these parameters appear from experiments. This transition state tells you about this process of this entropy energy exchange. And the stability just tells you how stable these things are. It's just the ratio of the rates, right? The barriers tell you how slow these rates are as they come together. So people, okay? So basically, as you can see, you, you, what I just told you is, how these systems go from non-native to native. And you have states that I love to show this one here. It's just like the plot I did for you the other day. The probability of being in the intermediate state, the native state, the nature state. What you see here is just to understand. On this case here, look, this is a logarithm plot. That tells you you start from being unfolded and now you fold, right? But you see, you never populate the transition state very much. It's 100 times smaller. So if you look at your simulation, you never see you on the transition state. That's exactly a two-state system. This is the case that's not true. You go from being unfolded to folded as the process goes apart. That's like you see. But you see that in the middle, you actually populate a state that's equally occupied there. So you're going to actually see on a simulation that you are there a substantial amount of time, right? So you're actually going to see it. So these are just feelings for what we are. Yes? Uh, I don't know if I'm, I understand right, but how can you quantify if it is in a one fold or Fold because fold you can know because okay. you know they're in the state, but between fold and unfold. Okay, let me tell you. Let me tell you two things. That's a very good question. Every time, both experimentally and theoretical, 
you have to have some probes that tell you what you're doing. So we love to have a quantity we call Q. There's the number of native contacts formed. OK? This is very nice theoretically. It's a nightmare experimentally. Because how do you actually count contacts? So if you come experimentally, there are many probes that people can have a look. People can look about percentage of secondary structure. For example, I'm going to give you a couple ones for you. And people do that by looking at uh, circular dichroism. Circular dichroism has precise peaks when you are alpha helical, where the IR. So you, can, you have some particular peaks that you can follow it. OK? You can look what a lot of people doing now. They're following some native FRET contacts. So you've got a few contacts. Know what FRET is? FRET is basically you have two molecules that fluoresce. You throw light here, and this molecule is going to create fluorescence, right? But if they are close to each other, before this molecule fluoresce, I'm going to call a donor, it's going to transfer energy to that state. And now this state is going to absorb and it's going to fluoresce. But this is going to have fluorescence on a no longer wavelength than this one here, right? So now you follow the two peaks and you know, are these things far apart? So you're always exciting this state. And you're trying to see if you have fluorescence from the other state. If you have fluorescence from the other state, you know they are close apart. So that means there's a contact between these things. FRET, if everyone uses this word, F-R-E-T, is fluorescence resonant, because they have resonance of the state, energy transfer. Right, so this is one of the techniques. OK? If you are slow folding proteins, you can look that by NMR. If you are looking at cytochrome C folding, you can look by the emission of that big aromatic group in the middle. So you look for other quantities. There are many of them I can come here. Some of them are equilibrium, some of them are dynamical. The dynamical ones were, were much more difficult because you had to excite and measure on times of the order of microseconds, what makes the entire life very interesting. So the bottom line is, if I come back here for you, oh, I'm sorry, the other way. And that's a very good question. If I'm telling you any of these states, I have to have a signature that tells me. If I have a protein like, like uh, CA2, it's a great protein to study. Because that protein is so funnel-like that only leaves unfolded or folds completely. So that means if everything comes together to fold, if I follow any quantity, if I follow FRET, if I follow uh, circular dichroism, if I look in, they all give me. If I have anything that differentiates the native state from the unfolded state, I'm in business. Right? What tells me that you're moving there because everything is coming together. So all I have to see is one particular of those quantities that get to fold to do that. But your point is well taken, and that makes the world very complicated. You have to have something that gives you the nature of that state that you can experimentally, you can experimentally probe. You could probe by nuclear magnetic resonance, but that's a very slow process. You cannot probe anything these days. I think magnetic measures, you cannot do anything more than a few milliseconds. So if you're looking, for example, a process that happens on microseconds, is techniques too slow. You have to integrate. So there are all these difficult and good things that are in front of you as they come about it. But looking for essence, just to tell you if you ever look papers on protein folding, they have these things that measure how fast a steamer relax. So we start with a system that tells me What's happening here? I can do this plot versus temperature. Here I'm doing this plot versus denaturant. What's denaturant? 
The nature is something that I put and destabilize the protein. Okay, one of the most common denatures is urea. Right, so known that basically the native Brazilians that didn't have great medicine, they knew that if they were bite by a snake, bitten by a snake, and basically poison our proteins, they knew at that time what you did, you cut, you push out, and you pee on it. Right, so they knew to put urine there. Right, but that's the, we had the, the most available rear they had at the moment to make sure they try to denature that protein and try to get the poison to go out. So, the, so basically, there are people that were not doing chemistry, but they knew their own statistical chemistry by, or empirical chemistry by knowing how to use the, the process of proteins. People sometimes tell you put hot water because Heat, if it's very hot, but then it has to be very hot. You almost have to burn yourself. Urea is much more efficient, right? You can unfold by temperature, right? So that's just... So this experiment, you run urea, and when you observe, when the protein is stable, this L and K, the equilibrium, depends much more of what? You observe that basically K folding is small and K unfold is large, and the other one goes the other way around. So here you're controlled by unfolding. Here control, right? So by getting this slope, you can find K folding and K unfolding. And they have these V-shaped plots, when you just look at the equilibrium of the process, that are very common, they call chevron plot. Very common experiments, because you actually can find what is the transition between them. <coughs> right, and, and uh, and uh, you, you, you can remember what's controlling. So if you remember this case, k fold over k unfold, you can see that you're dominated by one, one case. One is k folds larger than k unfold, the other k unfolds larger than fold, so in, in these ways you are dominated by one. Okay, now, let's continue a little bit. What changed this game for a long time? Experimentally, Ci2 was the first molecule. Every field changed enormously when you have Experiments that can do big things, and you can actually now compare theoretically. So let's go back to his question, how you observe what's happening on this process. So one of the experiments that really changed this field is what they call five values studies. So five values is a very simple idea. Let's assume you have this protein here that starts here and I make a mutation that stabilizes this protein, that stabilizes this protein, or, or that stabilizes. I go from the dash lines to actually stabilize. You see, here you have the native state, here's the native state. See, if I make a mutation, become more unstable, the final state goes up, right? So what I have here is what I call a delta, delta GF, that means you make this protein more unstable. So now what they ask is the following. What well, they asked the following at that time was the following. Is this, is this contact formed before or after the barrier is formed? Is that a contact that basically is before the transition state is formed, or is this a contact that comes after you cross the transition state? They just come for the ride down. If the contact is formed afterwards, you're going to change the stability, but you're not going to change the folding rate because you're not going to affect the barrier. If this contact is formed earlier, if you destabilize it, you make the barrier high. So what you can measure now is what I call this delta, the, the changing barrier of the change of stability. If this number is closer to one, means that the contact is formed before folding. If this contact is close to zero, means this contact is formed afterwards. So what you can find, you can find the structure of this transition state, which contacts are formed. And some of these contacts may be formed half of the time because uh, it's an ensemble state. Sometimes you're formed, sometimes you're not formed. But these quantities start to allow you to compare to your simulations in a quantitative way. Is actually this part of the protein come before? How does these states look like a direct comparison? That came on the 90s, the early 90s. That's when people start to be able to do multiple mutations in proteins. 
So a change the field of protein dynamics and stuff like that, this ability, where people know. These days people have, they call alanine screen. They change every amino acid by alanine and see what happens. Right, so you start to see, you could do, statistically do multiple mutations and understand all the details of your entire landscape by experiments. So five values became very popular. The experiments were there. Okay? So what Paul told you, I'm not going on details, you created these models that you know more than you need, want to know now. And you can start using these structure-based models now to see if these structure-based models can actually agree with the experimental transition state that people observe on experiments. So here is an example of the protein you run yesterday, 62 amino acids, CI2. Okay? And this is another protein that we call SH3. Okay? So what this tells you, this protein here on this plot show the simulation results that tells you which part of the protein is formed into the transition state. So, let's look at this plot. So you're going to see many of these plots on your life. You never get confused in your life again. Okay? This plot, okay, this is a, what you call a contact map plot. Every small square here, forget about the color now, tells you if that contact is formed on the native state of the protein. Right? So that's a 2D plot that tells you about the structure. So you can see, for example, you can easily see that here you have an alpha helix. You see here's the diagonal. You have all the II plus 4 contacts. Right? So this helix is right here. Right? So you come on this map, you see you start to see that you have about 15, making a contact with 17, 19. You have II plus 4, right? So what you have is a line away from diagonal, separate by 4, going up 4, right? That's an alpha helix. Here, you see these anti-parallel beta strands. The parallel beta strands here, they look like that. The, okay? No, actually, this is a parallel beta strand. There's a non parallel beta strand. You see, there's a beta strand. You come here, and then you can start to move here. Okay? So, the parallel beta strand says you are here, then you make a turn, a certain stick, and then after the turn, you start to move up the same way. Okay? So, you can come from here and get the entire structure out of this plot. So, that's a contact map. The first thing you're going to see is you're going to see parallel beta strands, anti-parallel beta strands, alpha helices. These are the features that are used to see. And then you have all the contacts from the loops that come here. They're not in a way that they come. Okay, so if I look at that, that's the first thing. That's what a contact map tells you. Okay, and after you get used, you look at, oh, yes, that's correct. Here's my, here's my alpha helix, here's my the two parallel beta strands that are here. I'm trying to see all these features of my protein here in front of me. So now, the red plots here, it's on my simulation. I did exactly that free energy plot here, did the probe. I look what's my native state, what's my non-native state, what's my transition state. I look out of my simulation. And my simulation tells me that what's mostly formed is, in the transition state, the alpha helix is fully formed, because dark colors tells you they're very formed in the transition state. So the colors tell me now, which of these contacts exist on the native state are formed on my transition state, when I'm at the top of my barrier, right? And you have this area here, what you call the mini core, right here. And that's exactly what people measure, observe experimentally. When we first published this paper, in 1990, it was great. We show you about the power of theory of predicting it. So, what Paul told you yesterday, actually the merit of the success belongs much more to the protein than to us. 
Okay, by what that I mean? I mean that uh, the protein has such a funnel-like landscape, so much bias towards the native state versus everything else, that as long as I have any potential that's not pathetically wrong, it's going to fold it. Remember what I told you about a system TF over TG that tells you this is proportional to the stability of the protein or the drive and this has to do with the size of the traps. Right? As long as this number is very dominant over that number, I'm in business. Because that's the way the system is evolved. And if this number is much, much larger, I can make mistakes on that number and I still fold there. So what happens is people afterwards with all atom potentials, with different, they all fold it. They all agree with the experiment. That's the nature of this protein to do together. The other thing, what this protein is telling you, is that you're really funnel-like. And that you see by, there's no preference in context other than context close to diagonal form earlier than context far from diagonal. What mean context close diagonal? You agree that if I have a random polymer going around, completely moving like crazy, making contacts that are shorter in the sequence, they are entropically easier to make, to make a loop that's very far apart. But other than that, tells you how much you are native just depends on how close you are to the diagonal. Does it make any difference if you start to fold from here or start to fold from there? You really have something funnel-like. It's just the distance diagonal forming these loops that comes in there. So you have many, many pathways to fold it. So if I look at that funnel figure I showed you in the beginning, you can imagine, yes, these native contexts are forming, add a little bit of more physics to it, add the fact that all things that close diagonal are form earlier just because of entropy, but you see that's very good. Now, when you run assays, yes. Okay, uh, I have a question about the proteins that are very uh, stable in a big range of temperature, because I remember that we said about the importance of frustration to the, the, the adaptability of the protein to different uh, uh, conditions. And then I was wondering how this, this balance between traps, frustration, and stability gets placed in, in a protein like the, the TAC polymerase that can still function from 30 uh, Celsius degrees to 90 Celsius degrees. So okay. Degrees Celsius. So there are lots of things asked on, on your questions, OK? So. What you're going to notice is that proteins tend to be things that are very, very tricky. So it depends on the function. These simple proteins I'm showing you, most of them tend to be enzymes. So if a protein is supposed to be an enzyme, that's a great protein to do protein folding. Why? Because that protein function is associated to have a perfect structure, either to do chemistry or to bind to a place, but supposed to have a single structure, and that's the functional part of that protein. So if I get a, and most of these enzymes or small binders, like CI2 is a Crypsin inhibitor on your stomach, they have to have this precise structure for function. Now, now, that's a good thing. Let's continue your question to, uh, to another level. This is a question that takes a lot of work, okay? Because you ask many questions in one question. Now, I may have proteins. Their purpose is to form dimers, if I have a transcription factor, stuff like that. So that may be the case that if I look at the proteins in isolation, they are unfolded. They only fold when they come together. Because in order to have function, they have to form a dimer. And third, you may have a protein that may have uh, two different structural states. Not a single one like here. It's not a single funnel. It's what you call a multiple funnel. They have two possible minima. 
where, for example, in bacteria, if a metabolite that binds, I change the stability of those states. So you have a, a state that's not working and a state that's working, and by binding something very far from it, that's where allosteric effects come, I can change the stability of those states. So when I do simulation, here I'm showing very simple proteins, but you can have all these different complicated cases. Temperature. If you look, uh, uh, most of your proteins tend to have the nature proteins, temperatures around 60 degrees. 55, 65, depending on the protein you have. Okay, you know that, right? You know that, basically. First thing you do it, I can do an experiment for you that proves that. You boil on an egg, you see all the white protein, the nature's temperatures below 100 degrees, right? You don't have to go higher temperature than boiling, right? Now, proteins are very adaptive. If you have animals that live on hot parts, they change their folding temperature to a higher point. Okay? So, for example, you have what you call this protein denature on high temperature on these bacteria that live on geysers and stuff like that. What may have denature, denature points over 100 degrees because they live on, on a boiling environment or a hot environment. They have to play with their stability. So this TF is a, is a dual number. It's a number that tells you what's the temperature that unfolds, but also this TF has to be higher than the environment you live on. Okay? So now, what's very interesting is that uh, activity of the proteins are also controlled around that TF or, or below. That's based on what's the temperature you live on. So if you do transition between two functional states, you try to do that at a wrong temperature. For proteins, if you have a protein in a geyser, they try to adjust themselves, their energies, in order to function at those higher temperatures. So, but what this quantity tells you is the following thing. You expect that you have a protein that's functional at room temperature, that this, this TF is higher than the environment temperature, and you expect that this one is lower than the environment temperature. Because you, you want your protein to be stable at that time, but you don't want to get trapped at that size. Right? So basically, so these techniques of design, here I just told you I want this bigger than that, but in practice you also have to satisfy these conditions as they move along. And proteins are great to adapt each other into that situation. Okay? Now just to make your life very curious, very curious, you look at SA3. It's a different protein. But what you observe is that SA3 has to form some contacts very far from the diagonal at the transition state. That's a non funnel like characteristic. But that's a geometrical requirement of the folding of that protein. Proteins can tolerate some non funnel characteristics like that, but not too many of them. The geometry requires these things to come together. And here, is some larger proteins, just show some simulations for you that show yesterday, some proteins. Here's Barnase, here's RNSH, here's QI. And these are proteins, you see, you run the same simulation you run yesterday, but observe these proteins show intermediate states during the simulation. They populate intermediate states as you move between native and unnative. And QI, for example, is a protein very common, and what I have is, has some native state there, intermediate some native state, there's a trap. When they are formed, you have to form and unform before you can fold. So when you do these structural-based models or any models, you actually can learn a lot about what's happening with these proteins. None of them are two states, and now you can make models for it. QI, I think I have a slide more for it here. If you don't, I switch. Yes, I do. QI tells you what? This protein, if you let it run very fast, try to form the helices very fast. Remember what I told you, helices are easy to form. However, it has to break these two helices in order to repack the score before it can fold. 
So if you form this helix too fast, now you have to break them before you can form. And you look during the process that you have to look this competition between the trapping state and the real intermediate in order for that protein to fold. Okay? All right. Let me skip this top here. Oh, here is just a, for folding of SH3. Why you have an intermediate trap? On the case of H3, you look that basically you form these beta strands very early, but now you have to get this distal part and bring together very far term here before you form the core, because you form the core too early, you don't fold. And now you saw Paul doing it. I'm going to skip here. I want to show one plot more. This one. This is something done in 2002, hold call, something you can do every day here. Try to do a full O-atom force field simulation for my SH3 protein. 2002, we had the entire Cray at the Script Institute in La Jolla running the simulation for over three weeks to do this problem. Okay, now you can do much faster. You can actually run with these force fields. And now here, I'm going to show this plot for you before I come to details because of, there are several things I want you to see here. First of all, I didn't plot a one-dimensional plot. I plot a two-dimensional plot. I have the Q that I told you about that tells you how many native contacts are formed. But also, I have my radius of gyration that tells you how collapsed the protein is. Right, that helps me to open the space, plot this free energy in two dimensions. This protein is run at room temperature. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, do this simulation like we do today, a full run and look the protein folded. So my collaborator, my former postdoc, Jean Chia and Charlie Brooks run on this paper. They did the trick that people did in those days, whatever you could do. You start from your native state, you run several unfolding runs, then you found the areas around each of these unfolding runs, you create a big diagram, you got structures on this area, and you run local simulations around these areas, and then now you try to match all the histograms, and you get a full energy profile. We can do much better these days. You can actually stop thinking, not matching histograms, and just turn on and crank the damn machine and run it. But why I like to show that for you? First of all, let me show the results. This is your free energy in kilocalories per mole. You can see you have more stable states here, less stable states here. Now, the nice thing about the simulation, it is our animal simulation. Here is all the waters, everything is in there, right? All the details. But what you learn is for this small protein is that your unfolded state is actually not extended as expected. People have this idea a polymer is extended. A polymer extends in tropically not the most likely state. And as you keep running the simulation of the states down this situation, we start to observe when you come here, the first thing you form is these local structures, like I told you before. Exactly like the structure of Bose mod tells you if you're closer to the sequence, you have those beta strands coming together. If you continue a little bit, you see that you have to bring that diverging term together with that thing, otherwise you cannot form the core. The next step is you have a protein that now the core is packing. Then you have a protein that's almost fold, but you have water on the pack. And that's something we didn't tell you about it. I could do it, but it takes a lot of energy to do it because I want to talk about a different topic. You have a process of drying up the core. Every protein has a final transition, get the structure, and then eliminate water and put water. You never want the core empty because vacuum is very expensive. But the nice thing is when we form this protein, when we form this protein, we are able to agree exactly with our structural based models. The problem I had is 
with these simulations is that the damn native state is just too stable. When I look at the simulation states, basically, I'm getting an occupation of the, when I'm room, around room temperature, I should be almost 50, not 50-50, it was more native, but not by this amount. Why we did that? Why that happened? Would you guess? Is it my force field that's wrong? Is that I am stupid? Why do you think that, based on what you did yesterday? And I'm going to tell you, the problem here is the following. How do they run the simulation? Remember I told you, I run lots of unfolding runs, and then I run simulation around the unfolding runs. Why do you think this state is getting more stable? Because my energy is too stable? If I tell you it's not because my energy is too stable, what's make that state to be? It's because my unfolded state is getting too unstable. There are only two ways I can get here. That means because of the simulation and not having enough computer time, the sampling I did here didn't sample enough of this unfolded basin. This particular technique that we create, we just haven't sampled. Today, if you do the simulation, you sample more than unfolded basin. More, you just don't have enough time to unfold it. When I undersample my unfolded state, my entropy of the unfolded state gets smaller, right? Because you have less states. The more states you have, the more, right? It gets smaller. If I make smaller, this state becomes the free energy, it becomes higher, end up with a final stability to the native state much higher. So it's something that because of the sampling process, I get the free energy towards the native state too stable, but on this particular case, it doesn't come from energetic mistakes, come from the fact that you're undersampling and your configurational entropy. How often you flow the state there is not plenty enough. These are great things. We knew that when we did the paper, right? Because there's so much you could do with the amount of computer time you had. You get the right geometry, you get the right thing. So one thing I'm going to learn about protein is that structures are very easy to get. Because, I would get there, because the structures tend to be about minimums on free energy. So they tend to do with first derivatives of free energy. Energies are second derivatives, so they tend to be harder to get, right? So, yes? So I formulate a, a question about this protein folding problem. In the uh, in the cell environment, after the protein be uh, synthesized, it folds, and it is recognized by another proteins that are able to assign if it's correctly fold, unfold, and if it needs to be adjusted to a native state fold. Well, that, so okay. it's, let them correct a little bit your statement, okay? So. We have, a, we have talked very little about proteins folding in vivo, so let me try to get to, you, to your answer. Normally, proteins come out of the ribosome after they are translated and they throw in the environment. Okay? There is not something that actually checks it's right or wrong right there. There are a few things. What's the main problem of the proteins when they come out? The proteins come on bursts of proteins. So you have to have the environment in such a way that they have to avoid, the first protection you have is to avoid these proteins to aggregate. Because they get together and glue together their hydrophobic groups before they get into their shape, you're in trouble. So a lot of the machinery right after the, right after the ribosome is not to help the protein fold. The protein fold experiment the protein folding, you have to fold each other. So if you come back to the origin of protein folding, the person that got the Nobel Prize for protein folding was Amson. So what Amson did is to notice he got a protein, in the case of ribonuclease, he unfolded by raising the temperature. Then he brought the temperature back and the protein became functional. So he came with the idea the protein is able to fold itself alone. They need the help. Okay? They need a machine to check it. Why? What was so clever about Amsterdam's experiment? 
Like I told you, you try to do the experiment every day. You cook your egg, you bring the temperature out, but when you bring the temperature down, the protein, your egg doesn't go back to its original shape. Why? Because you have so much protein there that when you unfold it, it aggregates. So what Amson did is your boiling egg experiment, but what he did, he diluted the protein enough in high dilution, so the protein had enough time to find its shape without aggregating. So a lot of stuff on your body, on your cell, is to avoid disaggregation. When this machinery goes wrong, you have lots of aggregation diseases that you can do a course about neural stuff like that, right? Basically, aggregation diseases happens everywhere. In most cases, not a problem because you some cells die, you just repo, re redo them. But if it's on your brain, your neurons are not redone and you have all these neurological disorders, right? So, it's the, so, okay. So that's the first part. Together with that, there are other proteins that they call chaperones. And the chaperones are proteins that try to give a second chance for the proteins to fold. So the chaperone doesn't help the protein to refold most of the time, what they give you is a second chance. They notice the protein has too much hydrophobic surface exposed, and the chaperone say, oh, if you have a hydrophobic surface exposed, you're probably in an unfolded state. So they bring it to the chaperone, unfold the protein inside the chaperone, give another chance to fold. So a lot of the machinery on the cell out there, in the end of the in vivo, Translation is tough. You are trying to make sure to give a chance of this protein. So they are not actually doing, because this protein is not like in my simulation, not like on the Amphison experiment, they don't live on infinite dilution. Right? That can help them to be on that particular shape. Now, there are many other tricks that come here. You have proteins that have part exposed, you have proteins that have to be transported in order to have post-translation modifications, right? Into the, into the ER, to the reticulum. So there are lots of other things that happen afterwards that's more complicated than what you're telling you here about it, okay? Okay. Let me change one topic. Yes, that's about right. We have. 40 minutes, right? Is that correct? No. Yes, 45. What time we finish officially? 45. 45. So we have 40 minutes, exactly the time I need. So I think we did enough of protein folding. I could talk more, but I want to talk about something else just for your curiosity because to bring an, an interesting topic that I think and even comment on basically on today's world. Everybody says we have alpha fold. Google is able to spread, predict the structure of every protein. There's an enormous amount of hype going there. And actually, I know all the people there. They're actually very smart people, but they're engineers. And tell you one of the reasons why these things have been successful. It's an area we started to work many years ago, about 2000, that creates the extra information that they use. But this you have to deal with database. We did a very cheap database. They curate a database for this process that cost about seven or eight million dollars to create the database. I didn't have seven or eight million dollars to create it, but it's the idea we developed. But it's a nice idea. And basically, it's going to tell you a little bit about uh, dealing with data. Just to give a little bit more, I wouldn't tell a full lecture on this topic. I won't have time to go on all the details. But at least I can give you a flavor of how these other things are done in a different topic. So. The idea we start on this problem is the following. As I told you, as I told you, all of you, or at least Paul told you more than I did, is that if I know the structure of a protein, if I know the structure of protein, I can write a potential just based on the structure of the native structure of the multiple structures. And with that potential, I can explore the entire landscape, the folded, the unfolded, the, uh, the transition state, the functional states, I can do everything. But that requires for me to know what the lowest energy state is. And that means I need the information. 
So, but that information is still very limited. It's not every protein you know the structure. That's why people start to do protein structure prediction and other things to do that. So, and should we believe? Can I tell you the structure prediction is so good I can then trash every NMR and X-ray structure, just let theoreticians do it. Why waste time? We can't do that on the computer. That's the question. That has been the goal, one of the goals. Not something a bit made to me the most interesting, but a lot of people talking about it, okay? So what we came here is a lot of times when I do protein structure prediction or trying to develop my structural-based models, I rely on having native structures. On the case of, of our structural-based model, if I have always, uh, a native structure, I can write my Hamiltonian and I can do everything like you did with Paul yesterday. On the case of structural prediction, I start to look all possible motifs that exist on real proteins. And now I try to do some learning, some neural networks to say, oh, how do I have small pieces, motifs, and put these things together? And there are many tricks in order to predict. So I try to learn from the data of the structures to get these things. What we decide to do is the following. The problem with all these approaches until we start to do things on the year 2000 was that people were just using structural information. And we know that proteins actually have many more sequence than structures. Okay, there are lots of sequences. You go out there on the world, there are lots and lots and lots of sequences. And actually, you're going to see that for a given structural motif, you have many, many different sequences that give the same structural motif. So here on the tree of life, okay, you start all the way. You see, for example, I'm showing a very simple structural motif here. As I told you, here's a helix turn helix motif and appears in many organisms on evolution in the same place, okay? So you start to see that now you can have that many, many sequences give the same structure. You have many more motifs than you have sequences. So can I use all the sequence information to help us with structures? So the idea is going to come that you have many proteins that fold to a given structure, but they're on different organisms or different bacteria, and they have different sequences, but they have the same structure. So can I use sequence information to help me with the structure? So the idea of covariance came from what I told you before. So the idea of covariance came from what you heard from Paul and from me. If I have a native structure, the context that exists on the native structure, they tend to be more stable than non-native context, right? Basically, I hope by now you got it. We have been preaching this sermon for five days, right? So basically, so under this sermon tells you what? If this residue mutates, you, you need this contact to continue to be stable. So you're going to have a compensatory mutation here that brings it to make stable. So what I'm going to do now is look at multiple sequences that fold the same structure. But I'm not going to look for residue conservation. I'm looking for pairs of residues. That mean covariance, residues that change together. And if they always change together from one pair to another pair, there's a good chance that basically this pair changed to another pair that's equally stable at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look all the sequence for the same protein and I'm going to look for which pairs of residues vary together that we call covariance. Okay, how we do that? Very easy. Very easy. The idea is always very easy. Techniques can be very demanding. So the idea is very simple. Let me at least present for you an idea. Let's assume this work that we had two great postdocs work on it many times ago. 
Farouk now is University of Texas, Martin is in France, in the Polytech Technique in, in, in Paris. Both of them were there. We were working with them together. And what is the following thing? Let's imagine now I can do sequence alignment. And so let me start with the problem here. In order to do this problem, that requires two very things. You have to have enough sequence information, and you have to have great alignment tools. When we start on 2000, again, we had had a big development that helped us to use these models. It was the time people were sequencing the world. These days, you look at these things. If you go to the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, you have this machine, the sequencing stuff, no stop all the time. So you have lots of sequence information. And people start to create this concept of protein families and protein domains. So basically, people can start to do alignment very well. But still these days, if you go to the bioinformatics field, you're going to get groups killed to each other. Like my nephew works at Illumina. They're groups that fight each other on how to align proteins, right? Because that's as, as supposed to be. But let's assume we know how to do alignment. Actually, that's not something we developed. We just used. What I tell you is things start to appear and these tools became available for you. So I align sequences. The difficulty of aligning sequences, as you haven't done it, because not just to align sequence. You have what people call insertion and deletions. Different things, put amino acid in the middle. And just to put what's the cost assigned to an insertion to a deletion is a big game on how to do it. That's why life becomes very complicated. But let's assume I can align these proteins. So if I can align these proteins now, for me, they're right here, I can start to look at the information, compare these sequences, okay? Now I'm doing this comparison. The first comparison is I look in one particular position. Which amino acid is more likely to happen? Right? All amino acids had exactly the same probability of that position. This Fi, the probability of that amino acid, would be the same for everything. But it's different. So this is the first number I'm going to keep you. That tells you residue occupants. Right? So, translating to physics, I'm creating an organizational level, you almost can say entropy of, of types. Which types more likely than other types? Just the probability that goes in there. The second term is the pairwise term. That's the term going to be the covariance. I look at two residues, and I say, what the probability of they coming together? So, for example, I look at position I, here is position six, and position J on a sequence, position six and 17. And I say, which pairs of amino acids I have? So if I look at this pair SP, here I have six possibilities, and SP happened twice. You can see the NL happens on, once. You can see that KE happens twice. So I can see what the probability of a certain pairs to come there is to six. Now what I'm going to do is exactly this problem, but for thousands of sequences for much longer proteins. Right, but still just a counting problem. There are lots of difficulties. You have to figure out the sequences are sequences. Uh, they are not independent because you have to make sure people are not sequenced the same parts so or you, you create a bias. So that's why protein families come to it. So there are lots of things to, to avoid bias on the sequencing problem. I'm not talking about that. But let's assume I can solve all those problems. These are nightmare problems, by the way. But by now, we know. We look to sequence. We see what's the identity between them. People on AlphaFold start to look local identity versus global identity. They spent $8 million. They did all these things to make sure you're not double counting. That's why their base was much more curated than ours. Right? But the idea is the same. So now, you're a physicist. Who is a physicist here? Who took a course of statistical physics in life? OK. So I'm just, that's just a provocation, right, basically? So if you have been done, if you had done enough statistical physics in life, you look at this problem and say, that's a physics problem that I have thousands of papers written on it. A system where I look, 
local probability versus pairwise interaction is the problem where I have a Hamiltonian like that. And let me tell you what the Hamiltonian is. This is a Potts Hamiltonian. For people who don't know what's a Potts Hamiltonian, let me tell you about Ising Hamiltonian. Even biologists love to talk about Ising Hamiltonians now. People do ecology evolution, they have Ising Hamiltonians. All. So the Ising Hamiltonian, let me tell you what it is. And then we come to the Potts Hamiltonian. Why? Because that's going to help you to tell you. The Ising Hamiltonian tells you that you have two interactions. First, there's a local field magnetization. So that means if I have a spin at this position, and I only have two states for that spin, up or down, right? If the field is pointing this way, the up is going to dominate that one. So that term here is exactly what you call the magnetic field term, this term here. But instead of having a spin up and down, I have a spin here that can have 21 orientations. Right? And I'm telling you which one is more likely than the other. But just think about icing spin and then go from 2 to 21. Right? Tells you which one is more occupied. The second term is exactly the interaction between two spins, like you have on here. Is this interaction? Ferromagnetic means they want to be parallel attractive or anti-ferromagnetic, they want to be opposite. You can have all these things. Now you have to learn the Hamiltonian. So why that's great? That's great because if I know this Hamiltonian, I can write the partition function just like I did yesterday. It's a little bit more work, but it's exactly what we discussed before. The difference is in the problems I did for you, the states were what? Different structures, right? Here, the states are different spins orientations. If I have 10 spins, I can have up, 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 down. Other. Now you look at all possibilities of up and down. And now you look at all the possibilities of up and down with 21 possibilities. So it's a big counting, but it's just the same thing. Computer can do that very fast for you, okay? But the same idea. So all we did before is here. There's a little bit of calculation to be done. Now, that's where the games begin. The games in machine learning is the inference game. I know that I want to have a Hamiltonian like that. But I won't say which Hamiltonian like that satisfy the best the boundary conditions that you have here. Basic, I want to create a Hamiltonian. Here, let's satisfy that. Why is that? Because I don't have a full Hamiltonian. I don't have the full global probability distribution. What's the probability of all these complete states? OK, you're only going to have this pairwise information. And some of this information may not tell you if the contacts are coming together or if the contacts are coming from uh, indirect coupling between another residue. As we are going to do later, I'm going to go and just go here. So, oh, I'm sorry. So if I only do that, if I only get the pairwise information, it's what people call in bioinformatics or in statistics mutual information. But that's just pairwise. I'm trying to get what we call the direct information. That's just the probability of two things coming together without saying that this interaction comes by connecting someone else. Do they have the global probability distribution? In order to get that, in order to get that, I have to do what we call it's an inference problem. OK? So now let me tell you something. You're going to hear a lot about it. There are lots of tools. Even if you don't know how to do it, you can learn and get a program to do it. That's how do I do that. I want to find these conditions, satisfy those conditions, and for everything else, I assume maximum entropy, maximum disorder. What that means? That means exactly what I told you before 
when you did, when you did the energy term, the canonical ensemble. What I told you is all the states had a probability occupation, probability to e to minus the energy over kT. That's my constraints. Here we have the PIJs, the same story. But things that have the same constraint, then they have the maximum disorder. That's what maximum entropy means. Right? And then you have tools to do that. That's exactly what you do in a canonical ensemble. So don't get complicated by it. It just tells you, there are theorems in mathematics that tells you the best global probability distribution you have is the one that satisfies the constraints you have. And for everything else, you do maximum entropy. Now, remember, the best you may get may not be good enough. If, if, they, if you don't have enough constraints, you may not there. If this entire probability of occupation depends on a three-bot term where interaction, then we'll be in trouble. But we, you know that the proteins tend to do on the pairwise. The interaction tend to be local, so these things tell you a good thing. So what now? This inference problem was a nightmare. But these two kids that are not kids anymore were very good physicists. And they figure out, if they solve this problem on a mean field, a mean field you assume that every spin sees the average, they showed that this inference problem was equivalent to invert this covariance matrix. So now a problem, there are lots of tools of inference, I'm not going to get in there, they could do with inverting sparse matrix. There's an entire field of inversion of sparse matrix became very fast, and these two became very efficient as a tool. So that went to the world as a way to do to compute these terms. Now, what you can see here now is if you solve this problem, now I can find how much information is on particular contact. I can measure what they call DI, that's the direct information. For people that have done statistical mechanics, you are pretty much measuring P log P. In mutual information, this is the PIJ there. So it just tells you, OK, it's information theory, channel entropy, whatever you want to do if you have done these things, just tells you how likely is a contact compared to the other things. If you haven't done it, this is just a quantity that tells you a little bit of how these things go, OK? And look, the larger the PI, the more information you have. Right? If you have everything equal, you'll be very small number for things. If you put everything, right? So these are things that you can get. So by doing sequence analysis and following these tools, if you haven't done a statistical analysis in life, people, I'm giving the statistical view of it. Mathematicians are going to give their, their own things. Stuff called energy and entropy, they're going to call gain and density of state, but it's all the same. Right? So it's the same story, right? So basically, some people do bioinformatics stuff for minimizing energy. They're optimizing gain functions. It's all the same. It's all the same game. Entropy versus energy with different names and different things coming together, and people get that. Now, we're getting late, but let's continue because I want to show a few results of that. So the beauty of that now is that uh, when you did that problem, now this we got a family of proteins here. I think we have about 131 families. And we figure out what, how many of these contacts, if I got my top contacts coming from this DI, or they native contacts on proteins or not. And you see the tools are, are great, over 90%. Let me give an example here. Here is a very simple protein, the sigma factor. Look, the red ones are the correct contacts. Sometimes you get a wrong one. And I can tell you the origin of these wrong ones may have other reasons for it. I will discuss that with you. But you see, you do much better than, than mutual information. Not only you have more correct, but they are more distributed all over the protein. So this game now became, I can get information about pair of residues that come together without looking at previous structure model. I'm just learning from sequence information. So that was a game changer for an entire structural prediction game. 
right? This is one of the success on AlphaFold. Like they create a much better curate database of sequence and they made this method make less mistakes than we made. But the idea was developed using physics in the past. Now the technique is out there. And AlphaFold is a great engineering game, by the way. It's a fantastic machine learning using these ideas. They do inference by many different ways. Give them credit and whatnot. But then you physical ideas brought the way of which information you're after. But also what we learn on AlphaFold is that if you look protein families where you don't have enough sequence for them, you, you run into trouble. Because there's no miracle, right? I have to have the information somewhere. Right? If that information is not available, I, I cannot do it. So the first thing people did is to show that if I have a protein where I just know the local context, just the local alpha helix, and now I come here and I put, I do a structural based models, but I put the interactions between the residues that, that uh, direct information gave to me. I get the top fifth of them. So they are not something that came from a structure. I can actually come up with the native structure. So in dark, light gray here is the real native structure. You see in red are the larger DIs. You see they predict all the structures. In green are the wrong ones, but even the wrong ones are around the neighborhood of what things get. There are very few that are sort of uh, out there. So you can see, you put this into a Hamiltonian, you're really predicting structures. Because if you have more, if you have a large amount of this context right, the polymeric nature of your system gives you the right structure, you, right? So it's like you don't have to have 100% correct. Because, because then you maximize, how, to have the maximum of them that are satisfied, it becomes a great tool. So this is one of the things that became very nice. But actually, there's a lot of things that you can actually learn from this information. So here is, for the 131 families, I look at you and I say, how far is the distance between the C alpha values for the top DIs, the top third couplings, the sort context for all these 131 families? So what do we learn? We learn we have a very big peak when things are actually in contact. That's why your system is very good about structure prediction. It's about five angstrom. You have another peak around eight angstrom, 10 angstrom. That's also a contact, but it's what we call water separate contact. In many proteins, you have things coming together with the water in between. So this is given. This is just total success. But the question now, how about this tail? Is this just mistakes of the method? Or is that interesting? So the question you ask is basically, if you're looking at this tail, you say, why is the method provide such information for that pair of contacts if you're not there? Is that just a mistake? But becomes particular even more interesting. You'd expect, oh, maybe I have a tail of mistakes. But why I come on 20 angles when I even go up? So at that point, several people were very happy, but I was greedy. I said, if this, some things don't give covariance information because you don't have enough context varying. You may have conservation. But if you have a lot of signal, something must have a reason. Right? If, you go to, if evolution is providing me with that information, it must have a reason. It must have a reason. So what I'm learning, I'm going to tell you a little bit, is this tail provides additional information about possible functional states, contexts that don't happen on the native structure, but they are on different states that are functional states. They may have a multimerization or multiple groups coming together. Let me give an example here. Here's a multimerization here on this NTRCR Aquifux Aquarius. If you observe here, you have an eczema. If I get a certain protein here, you see that the residues are very far on the protein. Right? But they make a contact between two proteins on this multimer. They are very close to each other. 
So the reason we are getting a big signal on the eye is not because it's structure is wrong, because you actually have to have this contact for the multiplication. So you can see that now the beauty of it is that you can come on this data, you can see you do well on the structures, you find the structure, but you can start to figure out why, what ad this additional information means in terms of multiplication, function, a loss theory. So there's a big effort on learning from this data. Okay, so this is all information in front of you. So for example, let me give an example. Here is a particular protein. I'm going to tell you this deribolacy binding protein. It's a protein some, that basically this deribolacy, when the sugar binds there, turns around and, and creates metabolism of sugars, okay? Now, in blue, people have X for this protein. This is just an example. They have two crystal structures, the open structure and the closed structure after the ribose binds. And in blue, I'm showing you the open structure and this red contacts on this contact map are the, contact, the additional contacts that come when you close the structure, when they come together. So uh, everything that was this top triangle here comes from X-ray structures. Now I come to my game and I compute the top 200 tough contacts coming from the eye here. I can do 150, I can do a minute, but here's a top two. So what you observe is there's a great similarity to the open structure here. You observe on this red box that I also got the contacts of the closed structures, but I get this green box. There are additional contacts that don't exist neither the open structure, the post structure. So now what I come is I do a structure-based model just like the one you did yesterday, but I add all these contacts, not only the open and closed, but I also add the ones here, everything that the eye tells me to add. And now I run my simulation. I get all my states. Here's the distance to close versus the distance to open, just to, to plot it. And then what I do, I do some clustering and see what happens. And I see I don't get two clusters, I get three clusters. I get a cluster here that's actually the open state. You see that the distance to open is very small. You get this straight here that base is the ligand free state. But I get another one that's a twisted state. That means when this ligand binds, not only you're closing, but you have to twist for the sugar to come in and twist out for the sugar to come out. And just appears from here. There are several experimental suggestions that told us the case. Some people have tried to run some old animal simulation with that. Some people try to do some quantum chemistry to suggest they did that. Now I can tell you that we predict that state's there. We didn't predict anything. We are just extracting information from evolution. Right, basically, the states is telling me here, it's not my model, it's the data. Right, so now we're fairly confident that you actually have these intermediate states because this context that stabilized that intermediate states are shown on covariance for you. So that's the sort of additional information. And how I build that, remember what I did before. I played that game like I told you before. You did a structural-based model for CI2 yesterday. You got CI2 structure and you put this context. What I did here, I did a structure model where I don't know the structure, but I built the Hamiltonian Assuming that my stable context that they want to come from, covariance. So now, look again. Now I don't have the structure. I build a structure model. Assuming those contexts, I see which structures show up on my simulation. So you see the power of the methods. Right? In many cases, you just predict the structure. But in this case, when I add all the data, I'm not predicting a single structure. If it was a single folded protein, if it was doing this for CI2 or for the smaller protein I showed before here, I would get a single minimum. 
right? Or get a single minimal given that structure. You can run it because that's a proton that's always stable in a single state. On this one here, like I showed before, I run a structural based model with these three, and what I get? I get three bases. Right, so you see the power of the method that comes from these models that's giving to you the answers that you have. So, one thing we have been, when we started with this model, we were very interested on using these methods to do dimers. That actually how we start this model. Bacteria have a lot of these transfers between what they call a response regulator and a kinase, and they're very similar in how you separate these things. And we try to use this method to figure out, we figure out which the partners were. Actually, that was the first structure we did it, 2009, that's when this thing started when this method really became powerful, 2009 is the first structure, you're able to predict these things, even before the crystal structure came with precision of three angstroms. What was this initial model that was done by Alex Chug? At that point, Farouk and, and uh, Martin was not there, so we didn't have this sort of a mean DCA was just invert a matrix, we had to do full inference. So we couldn't do many numbers of residues, it's just very complicated mathematically but we are able to get the first structure that came here. Now, what's cool is you can do problems now that actually a lot of people use that's creating dimers. Many proteins in biology are controlled by homodimers. They come together. And sometimes you have the structure of these monomers, but you don't know what the dimer is because they leave intermittent. Very hard to get the crystal structure. So what I do, I disrupt the problem like I did before, and I look at the context on that tail, and I assume the context on that tail are the ones that form dimerization. They don't exist on the monomer. And that's becoming a very powerful tool with some other tricks into the game to get structures into these dimers. Now, let me show a case. The interesting question, I'm going to use this as my last topic today, is just for you guys to have a little bit of feeling, is can I use these systems to compute structures of a gigantic proteins? Paul is very interesting on full virus, capsids. Can these things help us to get things that are much larger than normal crystal structure that you have? So you have proteins, another area you work with genome folding, what they call SMC proteins, is structural maintenance chromosome proteins. These are the proteins they're able to stabilize the structure of the chromosome, like condensing, cohesion. They're gigantic proteins. So this work we did together with several people in Peter Wallen's group, and basically Dana Krepa was a postdoc, Ryan Shang was involved. All these people say, can we go do that? So just to remember, these proteins tend to use and help to form loops and help on the structure of this chromosome. But, And what do we do? We say, let's get this gigantic protein, and now you're talking about thousands of residues. And I do the same game I just told you before. Okay? Here, you start to see you're going up to 3,000 amino acids here, okay? These proteins form these big loops. Remember I showed that loop on that structure before they form a hinge. And here they have what they call the colizing proteins. That's where you have the activation. That's where you have the motorization. You have ATPase aspect of the protein. So the question is, and you have this protein called SS, SPP, SSPA, SSPB. And the question is, the question is, what's their distribution? How much we have, right? So basically, do I have two of each? Do I have one of each? So you want to get a full stoichiometry of this situation. So what Dana did when she first worked? She looked at these entire proteins 
And actually, pieces, people have been very interested in it. This is a particular condensing in bacteria of this many. And people have crystal structure of different pieces. You see they have a little bit of crystal structure of the hinge. They have some bindings, you see, of uh, this bottom part. They have done here, they have interaction of the hinge. They have some, interact, some parts of these proteins crystallized, separate, but they have some interactions between the hinges, right? But they don't have anything else. So this is what we know from crystallography. So the origin is people have been able to crystallize small pieces of this protein, right? And that's the orange part we have here, okay? So what we do now is we apply our covariance, di, and I figure out which contacts come from me. And when I do that, you see that I fill up this map. And it's nice because, you see, in some cases, I even agree with crystallography, what tells me that actually the method is working. But in some other areas, this area, particularly how the proteins come together, you actually get no information from there from crystallography because there was no crystal structure for that. So, so first thing that uh, Dana did is how many of these proteins, SSPA and SSPB, are there? Do we have two of one, three of one? How many do I need here in order to satisfy these contacts? And she learned that you need two SSPAs and one SSPB. That's the only way you're going to satisfy these contacts. And you have a single loop, single ring, not two rings, that come from the stereogeometry. So just from the contacts, you can solve the stoichiometry problem, okay? And tells you the powers of this method. So just to have a look here, now you have the full complex, you can predict the structure of this complex, you can get the full stoichiometry, you give the same structure. Now, just for you guys to have a feeling, look, this is a gigantic protein, okay? This is just to show you a nucleosome on the ribosome, that's the size of it, about 10 nanometers. This protein is 30 nanometers long. These are really gigantic proteins, okay? And she learned from here a lot about the stoichiometry of this protein. And the second part, she started to look the, re the region of the hinge. And when she goes to the structure of the hinge, that's the top part, she observed the following thing. There is this part here in orange, and this here, actually agrees with crystallography because they have the crystal structure of the hinge. But actually, the additional contacts you don't see from crystallography. So now I can put a structural-based model of the hinge, including all these contacts, right? And when I do that model, you see that now I have a closed structure, I have from X-ray, but I also have an open structure. That's probably when the hinge opens in order for the DNA to come in. So you start to see the power of the method. You can predict structure, but also can predict functional structures, and the contacts are give you the entire game here. And actually, if you look at the open structure here, the blue is positive. You see there's a big positive cliff in order to get the negative DNA to come in. Right? So there are lots of things that you can learn out of these methods what do I have afterwards? that comes from looking at problems like that. Okay, there are a few more slides coming afterwards you guys can enjoy, I'll give you the full list of it, but I'm going to stop here because you're on time. But I think I give you a feeling of lots of things that you come. So I hope during that week, you understand that basically proteins, like every molecular machine, they're dynamic with states. They live between order and disorder, different than large physical machines that have one shape. They, they sort of going between order and disorder is part of their functional states. I think we gave you these general ideas, how to compute these dense of states, partition functions. You learn from Paul how to do simulation. Paul focuses on a structural-based simulation because it's faster, but the same scheme of structure you have, you can change the potential to a full potential with waters and play the same game, get dense of states, get partition functions, get these things. You see how you connect to experiments, and you see the power of structural-based models. In some cases, on the beginning of our life, we we're getting them from a structure we knew, but now we are building them to discover 
not only predict structure, but also predict functional states that come out of it. Okay? So if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to ask. I want to thank your attention. Thank you for a lovely week. You guys were fantastic. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Cadê a Natália? Natália? Você... What, where we do the picture? Here? Here. Some have, yes, they are more or less, they differ then move in one direction, move the other direction, but more or less same function. Different. These ones here you talk about, right? What? These proteins here? No, no, like in the beginning.